So last week, we kicked off a new series called Shake the Earth, and uh, Brandy Keith did an amazing job getting us started in this line of thought. As This is our prayer, that God, through the local church, would begin to shake the earth, and that the church would burn brighter and brighter and brighter as the world grows darker and darker and darker, that all would see that Jesus is alive, and he's living inside of his people. I want to start off today's message with a story. Many of you know that we went to C3 conference a few weeks back and, um, you know, it gets pretty loud and rowdy when, uh, when over 100 mountain movers head to Texas. And uh, we were out one night after uh, one, of the, uh, one of the events, and we all headed out to dinner. And we ate at this great, uh, you know, burger restaurant. And, and when we were done eating, we headed to the car. And as I was leaving the parking lot, you know, I, I'm in, I'm in C3 mode. I'm in party mode. I'm like, we're going to make some memories. And I've got, I got a, a, a car full of teenagers. And uh, so I, I kicked back the sunroof and all the windows came down. And I said, you know, these teenagers and all these church people here, these starchy church people need to know what real music sounds like. So I crank up, you know, I've got this playlist um, that we love to play play when we're, we like to be on the water during the summer and um, we've got some of the best songs. And um, so I crank up this song. I mean, none other than Elvira by the Oak Ridge Boys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's an obvious choice if you're wanting to totally jam out and have fun. The best song, it's just so catchy. So we're sitting here and we're jamming along. The, the, actually, the, the, the teenagers are like, <laughs> like this, but I'm like, I'm getting down, you know, and, but I'm, I'm listening to the words of this song. You know, I've, I've been dancing to the song in my underwear since I was like about five and nothing's really changed. I'm just bigger, but I love this song, but I've never really paid attention to the verses. And I was just listening while we were going down the road. And, and here's the verse that says, tonight, I'm going to meet her at the hungry house cafe. I'm going to give her all the love I can. Yes, I am. She's going to jump and holler because I've saved up my last $2. Man, that won't go very far today, I'm telling you. We're gonna, but he says, we're going to search and find that preacher man. And I'm singing, Elvira, Elvira. Doom, 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 doom. My heart's on fire for Elvira. Boom, 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 doom, 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 doom. Giddy up, boom, ba, boom, ba, ba, mow, mow. Giddy up, boom, First service boom, did better. Boom, Come on, you guys. <laughs> High old silver. What? Oh, wait. Come on, somebody. That's what I'm talking about. And so we're giddy. I mean, the whole way back to the hotel, giddy up, boom, boom. I'm like, I'm loving this. But I heard a phrase in that song, in that verse, that stood out to me. And I was thinking about it all the way back to the hotel. And in fact, I've been thinking about it for weeks since we left Texas, and I cannot get it out of my head. The Hungry House Cafe. I'm thinking to myself, is this a real place? Because if it is... I have to eat there. (laughs) We just left a restaurant. We just ate burgers, man. I'm losing my mind. I'm I'm normally like counting carbs when I'm at home, but I'm in Texas losing my mind. Eating all sorts of stuff. Anything you put in front of me, I thought I was stuffed, but I love food. We left that place and it wasn't two minutes. I'm like, where's the Hungry House Cafe? We got to check that place out and get something to eat. Because the name says it all. It's like Hungry House. Come on. Come if you are hungry. Come if you are starving. And when you leave this place, like you're going to leave beyond your wildest satisfaction and dreams of what it means to be filled by food. Come and eat. How many of you guys love food as much as I do? Can you just raise your hand? I love food. It is a gift from God. Food is amazing. I love food. If you don't know, we just came off a three-day corporate <clears throat> fast. So and that's I'm, the introduction. I'm ready to eat. <laughs> I'm ready to eat. So I, I'd love, but let me ask you a question. Have you ever just been really hungry? I mean, really hungry. Right? We got this. We have Steve and Kathy Hanna over to my left, and you're right. This couple, raise your hand, Steve. Okay, because this story's about you. Early, early in the days of this church plant, they were among the few couples that met in our mobile home in a field to my right. And we were fasting, and we were praying, and we were searching for God. We were hungry for God. We wanted Him so bad. But we hadn't eaten for days, and 
we're just sitting around just talking about nothing else than, well, food. We were hungry. And Steve says, he tells us a story. He says, I remember back in the day when, you know, it was me and like my roommates and we were living in this place and the weekend came and there was like no food in the house whatsoever and we were starving. He said, so we look in the pantry and the only thing we could find was a can of dog food. (laughs) And I was like, then what? (laughs) And they're like, well, dogs are carnivores and we're carnivores. We all eat meat. I'm sure that's probably what's in that can. So <laughs> I guess they broke it up into four chunks, smashed it down and fried it. And he said, they ate it. And I guess you got sick as dogs, right? They ate dog food. It's amazing the things that we will eat when we get really, really hungry. You know, most of us in this room have probably never been to the point where we were literally starving to death. You know, we make that statement all the time. Brad makes that statement if he misses a meal. He's like, I'm starving to death. I'm like, babe, you're not actually starving to death. There is some reserve. You can hang on a few more hours. It's okay. But you know, there are moments in history where people literally were starving to death. You can go back in the Old Testament in 2 Kings and you can read a story where there's a famine going on with the children of Israel. And the Bible says that because they were so incredibly hungry, they began to turn and eat things and look for things that you would not normally go after. For instance, a donkey head was selling for 80 pieces of silver and the cup, get this, of dove dung. That's poop. That's poop. Was selling. I mean, you were not only, you were literally buying it as your meal. You jump down a couple more verses and it says, today we'll eat my child, tomorrow we'll eat yours. You know, it's crazy. It's beyond our comprehension and quite disgusting, to be honest, as you begin to read some of the Old Testament, what people did when they were so hungry, when they were literally starving to death. But you know, I think that when you begin to look around today at people, if you'll slow down your own pace long enough to see people where they're really living, you'll realize that there are some really hungry people in our culture. There are people who are hungry for peace. There are people that are hungry for satisfaction. There's people who are hungry, looking for fulfillment. And here's what's happening, guys. Because they're so hungry, they're going to all the wrong things. They're turning to all the wrong things. They're looking for the right thing. They're looking for peace. They're looking for happiness. They're looking for satisfaction. They're looking for fulfillment. All the things that we understand only come through the relationship of Jesus Christ. The only way we have those things is when we surrender to Jesus. But we are in a culture where people are desperate and they're hungry. And for you and I that have Jesus, we look and we're like, why would you do that? Why are you popping those pills? Why are you smoking that? Why do you constantly go to the substance abuse? Why do you keep going back to that same type of person when over and over and over you just keep coming out with the same results? You're hurt and broken because they're hungry, because they're searching. The fact is we have the answer. The answer is here and the answer is in Jesus And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today as we are talking in part two about being hungry for God. If you joined us last Wednesday night, we all uh, just crashed the movie theater, a bunch of mountain movers and, and their friends, and it was amazing. But in that, in that movie, Jesus Revolution, there came a point in the story where Lonnie Frisbee, the hippie evangelist, is, is, is having a conversation with the pastor of this small declining church, and he was trying to help him understand why hippies uh, in that day were so misunderstood. You know, they were rejected by society, and he was trying to explain like they're actually looking for all the right things right they're looking for the right thing but it's in all the wrong places they're looking for God and, and he had to, he was trying to help him to understand and you know there's so much truth to that uh, in terms of today's society and culture there's so many people like Misty was talking about so many people around us around you and around me each and every day that are hungry 
They are so incredibly hungry, and so many of them are looking for the right thing. They're just looking in the wrong places. I believe there's, there's three types of people today. And the first type of person would be that person that, man, they're, they're hungry for God, but they just don't know it yet, right? They're searching. They're, tr- they're trying. It's process of elimination for them. They're trying everything they can find to bring fulfillment and to get full because they're hungry, but they just haven't recognized yet or realized by experience and through faith that it's Jesus, like he's it. He's, he's the answer. They don't realize that's what they're looking for. The second person, though, that I, I believe that, that is common to many of us, especially in the church world, is those who, man, they've, they've tasted of God's goodness. They've tasted and seen that God is good. But as they've grown in their faith and time has passed them by, they just begin to settle. And they begin to kind of ignore the hunger pang that is deep within inside their soul. And they get comfortable just coming to church and they've forgotten how to be the church. Is that you today? If it is, I'm, my goal by the end of the series is to break you out of that, right? The third type of person, though, is the person that is so desperate and so hungry. For, you may have been saved 50 years, but you are so stinking hungry for the presence of God. You just can't stand it. Some of you, maybe you gave your life to Jesus last Wednesday night at the movie theater, and you are so, I had people come up to me and say, I want to be baptized. Isn't that awesome? Can you give God praise for that? There are people around us, they've just given their lives to Christ, and they are so hungry, they've realized, this is what I've been searching for. This is what I've been wanting this whole time. And I tried it through people, through places, through things, and it never paid off. But I finally realized what I've been searching for this whole time. I finally got a hold of his garment. His name is Jesus. I finally attained him. And I realized, guess what? I've grabbed a hold of him, but there's more. There's a never-ending supply of the glory of God, and you have to have it. You just have to. We have to get to a place where we are hungry. So that's what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes, our hunger for God. When I think about being hungry for God, I think about a guy by the name of Joshua. You may have heard of Joshua. He was known as the man who led the children of Israel into the promised land. He's the one who led them in battles. He's the one that led them into Jericho. They possessed the land. But you know, oftentimes when I think about Joshua, I don't think about the early years of Joshua's life before he was Joshua the leader. Well, the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 33, it kind of takes us back and paints a picture of Joshua, probably honestly, as a teenager. And I wanted to just paint this picture for you. You see, the children of Israel had came out of the land of Egypt. They were in the wilderness, and they basically, it was a campsite with about 2 million people. Now, I don't like camping. I probably wouldn't have enjoyed it that much. But this is what they did, guys, for years, camping out in the wilderness. And so Moses would take a tent, and he would take it outside the camp, the Word of God tells us, and he would set it up, and it was called the Tent of Meeting. And the reason it was called that is because this is where he would meet with God. This is where he would go. And the Bible says that face to face, God would meet with him. But he wasn't the only one that went into the tent of meeting. Because there was a young man, his assistant at that time, by the name of Joshua. And Joshua and Moses would go into the tent of meeting. And the Bible says that when they did that the manifested presence of God would literally be visible to everybody else in the camp because God would, would come down in the form of this cloud and just settle over the tent. And that when he did, everybody else would go out to the front of their tents and they would bow down and they would worship while Moses and Joshua went inside and they were meeting with God. Here's what I want you to see. In Joshua, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 9, I guess you already have it up there. It says, as they went into the tent, the pillar of the cloud come down and hover over the entrance while the Lord spoke to Moses. Now go to verse 11. And it says this, inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Check this out. Afterward, Moses would return to the camp, but, say but, the young man who assisted him, Joshua, the son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. This passage always made me pause and wonder, why did Joshua stay? 
the leader left. The pastor, if you will, dismissed the service. Moses got up and said, okay, God, it's been good. It's been a good time. I feel empowered. I feel inspired. I'm ready to go back out. I'm ready to go speak to the people. And he got up and he went out. But Joshua remained. What it begins to show us is the heart of one who is hungry. Because Joshua was not willing to get up and leave while God's presence was still there. While God's presence was still there in that place, he was like, I'm not going anywhere. There is nothing that this world has to offer that is better than what I am experiencing right now. And I believe that is one of the main reasons why later on we see Joshua was the man that God chose. Joshua was the man that God said, you're my man. You're going to lead my people into the promised land. You're the one that has enough faith. You see, when all the spies went in to scout out the promised land, the land of Canaan, 10 of them come back. Eight of them said, man, the land looks awesome. But there are giants in that land. There are challenges. There are mountains that we don't want to have to deal with. But guess what? Joshua was one of the two. Joshua and Caleb. Joshua said, what are you talking about? If God said it, we can have it. If God said it, he'll do it. God said that's our land. Who cares what we see with our physical eyes? Don't you want to know what's on the other side of God's promise? Why do you think he had the faith to do that? Because he remained. When other people said, church is over, let's go. Oh, I did my five minutes, time's up. Oh, you know what? I don't actually have time to get in God's word today. Don't have time to be in your presence, but I love you, Jesus. You're first in my life. I got the t-shirt on. Joshua stayed put in God's presence. That's hunger that will change a nation. It's hunger that will cause a generation to say, what do you have that I need? What do you have? What is it about you? That's what Joshua had because he remained in God's presence. He was hungry. So there's two things we want you to know and two things we want you to walk away with today. The first thing is that God's presence will satisfy your deepest hunger. God's presence. It's God's presence that will satisfy your deepest hunger. Jesus said, I'm going to bless those of you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And the result is if you hunger for me enough you will be filled. That's his promise to you. God says, if you come after me with everything you are, if you get really hungry for me and you chase after me, you're going to catch me. Why? Because he wants to be caught by you. He wants to be caught by you. He, he called David, King David, a man after his own heart. Why would he get that title? I'm kind of jealous. Why would David get that title? I think he, David answers this for us when he wrote in Psalm 42, as the deer longs for the streams of water, so longs my soul for the living God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? When are we going to get that thirsty and that hungry for God? When are we going to just push past the, the, the routine of our life and through the whirlwind of our, of our daily life and our weekly life and say, God, I, I, I need you. Like more than anything else, I need your presence because you realize that just a moment in the presence of God can change everything. Do you realize that? I don't have time to go after God. I've got to work on my marriage. No, get in God's presence and your marriage will change. I don't have time to get in God's presence. I've got to figure out my finances. We're going bankrupt. No, get in the presence of God and your finances will change. No, I don't have time. I'm dealing with sickness and illness and emotional trauma and all these things that I've been through. I'm trying to go to counseling. I'm not saying counseling is bad, but I'm saying just get in the presence of God and everything will begin to change. It's the glory in the presence of God that changes everything. Don't you understand you were made to be in the throne room of God? You were made to be in his presence at all times. That's what we are wired for. And that's why so many people spend their lives searching. They're chasing and chasing and chasing after this, this, this thing and they end up empty. Because they're hungry, but they're hungry for the wrong things. What are you hungry for today? Gosh, this is, should be stirring in our hearts that God would move in our hearts and in our lives and through our church. You look back in American history, 
And, you know, you see what's happening right now. And, and Brandy touched on this last week when she brought that message to us about, about um, coming alive to, uh, through prayer. And, and, and she showed that video of how God is just, he's moving on college campuses and in churches. And I saw a few weeks ago uh, in the Philippines, thousands of people coming to Christ and being baptized. And it's amazing what God is doing. But you realize God has done this, what we call an awakening, where, where the whole culture takes notice that God is on the move and he's real and he's alive in the hearts of his people. He's done this four times in American history. Four times. I want you to watch this video and just, just watch the, just really quickly an overview of what God has done in this country since the early 1700s. Check this out. He transformed you and you become a new creation in Christ. The word of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. That challenge is one that we're willing to accept and one we intend to win. It matters little, my friends, how the headline provided the heart is right. And the interesting thing about the Jesus movement as reflected in LA is now the church is filled with young kids sitting everywhere and really on the heels of that, I came for the first time when this thing was in full explosion mode, getting notoriety, it's on the news. And one of the big things that everyone was attracted to were these baptisms. It happened at a beach called Pirate's Cove in Newport Beach in Corona del Mar. When I was baptized, I just sensed God's presence there. And it, it was like a magical moment. The whole thing, we didn't know we're living history. We're yeah. just getting baptized. We didn't know this is going to be on the cover of a magazine. It's going to be an iconic yeah. image. We just thought we're getting baptized. Yeah. But, but we were living in a little moment of time that was very special. And it was just sort of drenched in the Holy Spirit. I don't know how else to put it. There was this tangible sense of the presence of God. This revival was happening. And for the churches that opened the doors to it, they experienced revival. And to the churches that closed their door to it, they did not experience revival. You know, the first century church changed the world in a relatively short period of time. And so we kind of felt like we were living in a time like that. There's enough power here to go out and change the world. And we pray that this will be the beginning of a spiritual awakening that will sweep the world. And, you know, that doesn't have to be something that we just hear about or something that we read about or something, you know, that we, we think, man, well, that, that's really cool what God did in American history. No, no, it's, it's happening now. Right. And, and, and we are at a, a pivotal point in the church to where we get to make the decision as to whether or not we want to be a part of it. Right. You get to make a decision right now. As to whether or not you want to be a part of something really big that God is doing in his church and around the world. And we're going to talk for the next few weeks about the, the, the key elements that have been found in every awakening where God has just shaken. He's shaken the earth. He's shaken the culture. And he helped everyone living in the dark to realize that the church is on fire. That Jesus is alive. And he's doing it now. The question is, are you hungry? Because the second thing you need to know today is that, that corporate hunger sparks revival. What does that mean? What does that look like? It's great when you're hungry just on your own. Hungry for God. Going after God. Man, you're growing in your relationship with him. Man, you're in the word day and night. You're constantly, you know, just in a state and a mind of just hungry for his presence. You're just a worshiper and you love to pray and spend time in his presence. That's awesome. But we begin to see massive traction when people like you get together with other hungry people and they link arms together, something happens. Yes. In fact, you can read about it. This will be your homework assignment. In Acts 1 and 2, I want you to read about what happened right about 10 days before Jesus left, right? Je Jesus is leaving, and, and, and about 10 days later, I'm sorry, this is what happens. He says, hey, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm out of here, right? But you will receive power when my Holy Spirit comes upon you, or comes and rests on you. You shall receive power. Power to, to do what? Like, why do you need power? Because power, power enables you to do something, right? He says, you shall be my witnesses. That means you are going to show the world that I am real, that my resurrection was real, and that they can find hope through Jesus Christ. 
Do you understand what God was doing in this moment? He said, hey, I'm coming. Listen, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit here in about 10 days. I want you to go stay in Jerusalem. I want you to go into this upper room. I want you to link arms with other hungry people. And I want you to pray and go after me like you never have before. And boom, there sparked the first awakening after Jesus left. Because what happened as a result? By the power of his spirit, multiple nations heard the gospel preached in their own language crazy what God did and nothing's different today God wants to reach the nations with the message of Jesus Christ and it's going to come from the power of his Holy Spirit but we need his Holy Spirit to rest on his church like he never has before but it's going to start with a bunch of people hungry people like you and like me coming together and saying God we're hungry we are hungry for you we are hungry for your presence come rest on us So my question for you today, again, is how hungry are you? How hungry are you? I hope you're starving for the presence of God because it's that very thing that will just shift what God is doing here in our community and in our church. And so many people can come to Christ as a result of it. In fact, I'm so passionate about this. I'm strongly considering changing the name of our church to Hungry House Cafe. Because it's just so catchy. It just makes sense. We should want people, when they drive by this church, we should, they should want to say, oh my gosh, I, I, have to, I have to go there because I am hungry and I'm thirsty for the righteousness of God. I want to see God poured out in my life. I want to leave that church filled and overflowing, overflowing beyond my wildest satisfaction where I've ever been filled in my whole life. I want the presence of God in my life. Come, all people who are hungry, from the north and the south and the east and the west, are you hungry? Come and eat. And Jesus promises that he will fill you with his presence. Are you hungry today? Stand up in the house of God if you're hungry today. Come on, everybody. This isn't a trick. Stand up today. Stand up. If you're online with us, stand up. Father, we are hungry for you. We are hungry for your presence, God. We are hungry for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, God. This isn't a doctrinal thing or a denominational thing. This is a promise that you gave your children through your word, that you wanted to pour out your spirit. In the the book of Joel, chapter 2, you said in those last days that you would pour out your spirit on all flesh, that your sons and your daughters would prophesy, speaking publicly the name of God and the word of God publicly declaring and proclaiming the goodness of God and as a result at the end of that chapter it says that many people are going to come to Christ as a result God we're praying move in our day move in our day God move on the hearts of those who are hungry move on your church today God we are hungry for you we are hungry for you we're hungry for you God with heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you're one of those that I spoke of earlier in the message. You're, you, you're hungry and you've been, you've, been, you've been hungry for God. You just, you just didn't know it until now. You've been searching for these other things that would fill you up and those things have never paid off. They've never satisfied, but now you realize it's, it's him. It's Jesus. Then I want to tell you that right now you, you can be filled as you seek him. You can be filled with his presence when you just simply ask Jesus to come and live inside of your heart. You can receive the precious, wonderful promise of his Holy Spirit to live inside of you. So right now with heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you and you're wanting to pray this prayer to, today of salvation, would you just join us? We're going to pray this as a church family. Let's pray this prayer. Father. Forgive me of my sins. I believe with all my heart. Jesus is the son of God. I confess with my mouth. Jesus Christ is Lord. Save me. Cleanse me. Work through my life. In a way that pleases you. Help me to make Jesus famous. In your name I pray. Amen.